the Bible. It's a collection of many books written over a long period of time, but altogether they tell one unified story. And it points to Jesus. Thanks, Tim. What's remarkable is that almost all the characters we meet in this story are deeply flawed. In both the Old and New Testaments, they fought, worshipped idols, broke all the rules, and generally struggled to do what is good in the sight of God. A review of those stories uncovers a surprising pattern where we can connect the righteousness of the people with their relationship with animals. Yes, you heard me right. The relationship of humans with God is often reflected in their relationship with the land and the animals. For instance, the first humans we meet are Adam and Eve in the garden, walking with God and living peacefully with the wild animals. Of course, it all goes bad, they mess it up, and they're exiled from the garden, and the peace is broken. God starts again with Noah and his family. Noah is described as blameless and famously follows God's call to build an ark where he lives at peace with the animals. Lots and lots of animals. Daniel is one of the holiest men in the Old Testament. He received a death sentence for refusing to worship a false god, and when he's thrown into the den of lions, no harm comes to him as he lives peacefully with the wild animals. And in Isaiah's prophetic depiction of God's kingdom, he shares a vision of vicious, wild predators living in peace with domestic animals. Once again, humans living in peace with God's creation. Even in the New Testament book of Mark, we read an account of the temptation of Jesus where he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan and he was with the wild animals and the angels attended him. So in the biblical narrative, when humans are following God, they're living at peace with God's creation. What about the other way around? Does the Bible depict environmental strife as a symptom that we are not following God? Well, the best place to look is in the Old Testament prophets. We sometimes think of prophecy as forward-looking, making predictions about what's to come. Now, there is some of that, but the prophets were also speaking to God's people on God's behalf about their past and the present and the future. Now, most of the Old Testament prophets wrote not to commend Israel for their commitment to the Torah, but to admonish them for repeatedly rejecting God and God's ways. And in many passages, that failure to follow the law is tied to suffering animals and a broken landscape. Now, there are numerous passages that follow this pattern. Let's hear just one or two. The prophet Hosea connects the condition of the land with the condition of the Israelite's heart. Hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites, because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There is only cursing, lying, and murder, stealing, and adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Because of this, the land dries up, and all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the field, the birds in the sky, and the fish of the sea are swept away. Or Jeremiah, who describes the condition of the Israelites. My people are fools. They do not follow me. They are senseless children. They have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil. They know not how to do good. And then he ties it to an image of a decreated world. I look at the earth, and it was formless and empty, and at the heavens, and their light was gone. I looked at the mountains, and they were quaking, all the hills were swaying. I looked, and there were no people, every bird in the sky had flown away. I looked, and the fruitful land was a desert. All its towns lay in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. Later in chapter 9, Jeremiah asks, Who is wise enough to understand this? Who has been instructed by the Lord and can explain it? Why has the land been ruined and laid waste like a desert that no one can cross? The Lord says, It's because they have forsaken my law 
which I set before them. They have not obeyed me or followed my law. Instead, they have followed the stubbornness of their hearts. They have followed the Baals as their ancestors taught them. And of course, we have to look at Romans chapter 8. Here, Paul asks us to see the creation as a character in the story of God, suffering under the unjust and foolish rule of humankind who is not living up to its calling as bearers of the image of God. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. From beginning to end, the biblical authors connect the relationship of God's people with the land and the animals as an indicator of their relationship with God. Bible scholar Douglas Moo says that the earth has its own voice, a voice that is raised in mourning and like the ground that received Abel's blood, is crying out for justice. Now while we aren't living under the Old Covenant, we believe that this general principle still holds true. When we are pursuing God, it can't help but leak into every aspect of our lives. It redeems our relationship with each other and with the land and the waters and the life they contain. Now this doesn't mean that everyone who is striving to do right by the land is walking with God. Nor does it mean that every earnest follower of Jesus will cause no environmental harm. But as we look at the world, as we see the condition of the planet, and we consider the loss of habitat and species, the pollution and injustice, the abnormal climate, floods and fires, they are all a sign of our brokenness, that we need to repent, and that when all is not right with the world, then we are not right with God. Now, there is good news. Jesus came to heal just that brokenness. His love and sacrifice can save us from our sinful nature. He's healed not just our relationship with God and more than our relationship with our neighbors, but our salvation can repair our relationship with all of creation. And that is the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks for watching. At Disciple Science, we are making these videos and our podcast to help you connect with God through nature. If you want to help us make more of these videos, you can support us by giving at our website at disciplescience.com, or now you can also find us at patreon.com. Just look for Disciple Science and you can support us there. Thanks. We'll talk again soon.